everyone. I'm very excited because it's my first time giving ground round. And my lab has been here uh, for about two and a half years. And we are interested in understanding basic principle of regeneration and what goes horry during cancer. So um, as you might very well know, um, to a support for regeneration is greatly given by stem cells and the cells that surround them, which we refer as a niche cells. And what stem cells have to do is to balance self-renewal with differentiation in, in many different lineages. Now, it has been uh, reported in several instances that alteration within the stem cell or the niche can lead uh, to um, disbalance of these processes and so lead to abnormal growth and cancer. Now, um, what we don't understand still and that constitute outstanding unanswered question in the field of stem cell um, is what behaviors do stem cells and their progeny utilize during regeneration? What's the functional role within a stem cell niche? Um, so if you were to eliminate these uh, uh, components, what would result uh, towards regeneration? And whether stem cells and signal regulate cancer? So in trying to tackle this question, uh, we favor as a model system in the skin because it's highly accessible and it continuously regenerates. You lose about billions of cells every day. Now within the skin, um, there are hair follicles and this is our model system. So up here is the epidermis, which is what you touch when you touch your skin. And then down below the dermis, the hair follicle will be embedded. And they're made by two different cell types. What you are seeing here is a schematic of an air follicle. So if you imagine to cut it transversely through your skin, what you will see is epithelial cells here depicted in green, in green that together with mesenchymal cells in red will constitute the hair follicle. And there is the interaction between these two components that regulate regeneration. In particular, at the bottom of the follicle, stem cells and their immediate progeny are located at the interaction with the mesenchyme results in the ability of the hair follicle to continuously regenerate. So during morphogenesis, follicles are made, both in mice and humans. And what happens postnatally is that the follicle will expand downwards. So this is very counterintuitive, because your hair are growing upwards. But in order to do that, your follicle needs to expand downwards and pre pre prepare differentiated cells that now will feed into this shaft and push outwards your hair. And then this lower part will destroy itself and then uh, the follicle will land into this short form and the cycles will repeat itself in a stereotypic manner for the rest of the life of the mice but also your life. Now, just to show you that studying stem cell biology uh, using the hair follicle can have an impact in human disease, Angela Cristiano has uh, recently mapped the gene hairless which when mutated give rise to alopecia. And when uh, you mutate the same gene in mice, you recapitulate the same phenotype. So what this shows is that understanding basic principle of stem cell biology um, can actually teach us about human diseases. So um, my previous work has shown that uh, stem cells can exist in two different functional states, a quiescent state and an activated state. And m I'll show you the one data slide about that. Um, here is again a schematic of an air follicle where the stem cells and the progeny coexist in the bottom of the follicle. What we have shown is that when the regeneration starts, this is happening not at the expenses of the stem cells, as everybody was uh, postulating, but it's happening at the expenses of the median progeny. So I'll walk you through the data. What you're seeing here is a cross-section of an air follicle. In blue is a marker that recognizes for you stem cells, and it's CD34. In red is a marker that recognizes the immediate stem cell progeny, which is an additional molecule called picadidin. At the beginning of a new growth, when this follicle is still short, if you give a pulse of BRDU, you can see which cells are proliferative. BRDU, which is green nuclei, is incorporating only in the progeny, but not in the stem cells. We have tracked those cells and saw that they participated to the formation of this long follicle. And what we saw is that once the follicle has become three or four times longer, that's when the stem cells now in this compartment, we start to proliferate and therefore you see green nuclei now in this compartment. So in summary, what this is telling us is that especially there are two different compartments, a quiescent and an activated one, which coexist. And the stem cell compartment can get activated over time and be temporarily controlled. 
And just to, for you to know, this observation that uh, we have made in the hair follicle, so the presence of these two compartments, quiescent and activated, um, have been also shared by different other tissues. So the blood and the intestine, which are very high turnover tissues, as well as low turnover tissues such as the brain, have the same conserved feature of the stem cell niche. So an activated and quiescent population coexist within all these stem cell niches. So be confident that we studied an, a, a broad general problem. The first thing we wanted to tackle in my lab is understanding what cellular behaviors do stem cell progeny utilize during regeneration. To tackle this question, we needed to do something that was a challenge and it was not present in the field, which was the ability of following the same cells over time. This is an effort uh, that was uh, done by Padelis, a postdoc in the lab, and now Elizabeth, my student, has joined the adventure. And what they do, they use a two photon to image a transgenic animal where we have marked uh, each individual epithelial cells. And what we use is a fusion protein of H2B with GFP. So you're seeing all nuclei of the epithelial cells only in the skin being labeled. And I'm gonna bring you the trip down to your skin where you are gonna be able to appreciate all the epidermis, all the nuclei. Um, and then as you go deep, you will see the beginning of the follicle, you will see the glands associated to it, and the stem cells and the progeny uh, with very high resolution. So when we put together this uh, slice um, optical section in a 3D reconstruction, you can now appreciate that out of a live animal, it's just anesthetized, we can image for the first time in a mammalian system the entire stem cell niche of the hair follicle. So what we can ask then is uh, many questions now. What behaviors have stem cells adopted during regeneration? In particular, whether division are specially regulated. As you can appreciate, the structures such as the hair follicle are very well structured. They grow asymmetrically. So we hypothesize that division may be regulated specially in order to have a growth only in one direction. And we wanted to ask also whether other dynamic processes would they take place. So what Padelis did is uh, do the same uh, Z-stack I showed you before, but now take it every five minutes. And what you are seeing here is a 3D reconstruction where up here is the epidermis, here is the hair follicle, so you see two follicles at the same time, the glands associated to it, and your favorite region of interest, the stem cells and progeny. And when we observe uh, these uh, movies, what we see is that we are absolutely able to capture the dynamic behaviors of stem cells and progeny in a mammalian niche for the first time. So the arrows are pointing for you at divisions that are occurring within the niche. And what this has enabled us to do now is to ask whether these divisions are spatially and temporally controlled. To ask that question, we have uh, performed these time lapses over several times for several follicles and map the position of division within this follicle, the frequency and the axis of division. So what you're seeing in this next slide is Padelli's uh, overlay of 13 follicles, where he sees the division are primarily happening at the tip of these follicles. The division are primarily vertical, so along the axis of growth of this follicle. What was the time? So that was f about six hours. Six hours. And every five minutes. So what we wanted to ask is also whether other dynamic processes were taking place to uh, give rise to such an uh, order structure. So up here is a follicle that is much more advanced in growth. Here are the stem cells, and now the progeny has expanded this much. And if we focus here in the lower part of the follicle, what you're going to see is that we are able to capture also migration events. The arrow are pointing for you um, as cells that uh, are going to be able, are going to show you migration pattern. So as you see, um, these nuclei move from the initial position uh, down below the follicle. And I'm gonna play one more time, and we see this uh, in uh, several regions within the follicle. So what I've been telling you so far is that we are able to capture dynamic processes in a, um, a normal physiological regeneration, and those processes are processes that are often altering cancer, such as divisions and migration. So what we wanted to ask next is what's the functional role of these niche components? So as I mentioned to you, both the epithelial and the mesenchymal component are required for hair regeneration. We know that signals are released from the mesenchyme, but it's not, not been test, tested whether the mesenchyme is required for hair regeneration. So if we were to ablate this component, would that result in impaired regeneration? 
So the way uh, Padelis did this experiment is by utilizing two transgenic now. The GFP already showed you, shows you the <coughs> follicle. Here are the gland, here are the stem cells, and here are the progeny. And he uses another fluorophore, RFP, to mark now the mesenchymal component. It can laser ablate this by two photon laser and results in follicle that do not have the mesenchyme anymore. And then what you can do, it revisits the same follicle and ask whether the regeneration is impaired. So the way he did this experiment is using internal controls. So he uses clusters of follicle in which he ablates only two follicles. And he leaves the others intact with an intact mesenchyme. And when he revisits over time, what he sees is that the follicle without the mesenchyme are stuck, they cannot grow. Whereas the surrounding follicles have gone on and uh, regenerate properly. So what this says is, number one is mesenchyme is required for hair regeneration. It's the first time that this has been ever shown. But also gives us the opportunity now to address the functional requirement of any population, both during regeneration, but also in hyperproliferative phenotypes. Now, so in summary, what I'm showing you is that for the first time, we are able to study physiological regeneration in a mammalian stem cell niche in living animals, which is the first time in the field. Also, we are able to uh, study dynamic behavior, such as division and migration, and others I have no time to describe to you. And we can test the functional requirement and show that mesenchyme is actually required for hair regeneration. So the last question I wanted to address with you is whether stem cells and signal are actually uh, necessary to regulate cancer. And you are all well aware of the cancer stem cell idea, so <coughs> what I'm going to dri drive your attention to, however, is a very neat tumor model that we're interested in. This is uh, based on a collaboration with Dr. Christine Koh from Dermatology, and these tumors, which are called keratoacanthoma, which Christine studied since a long time, belong to the family of squamous cell carcinoma. However, differently from squamous cell carcinoma, which only grow, this keratoacanthoma can grow and self-regress, and this is a unique facet of these tumors. So what this uh, made us hypothesize is that the regression of the keratoconthoma from growth to complete remission may be actually fueled the same way that the hair cycle self-regress. So as I mentioned to you, the follicle grow and then regress into the quiescent state. So what we hypothesize is that the deregulation of stem cells and their signal might be responsible for tumor regression. So to start, to address this question, Gianni uh, has taken major effort as a postdoc in the lab in setting up this cancer model in my lab. And so what he did, he uses a, a carcinogenic model that is present out there with the NDA to not only develop the keratoacanthoma, but also see that they can self-regress in our hands. And so what Gianni was to ask is then whether keratoacanthomas are stem cell derived. And he's doing that by two approaches. The first one is asking molecularly whether they do retain a character of stem cells. And that won't be a stringent way to say that they come from stem cells. And the other will be by lineage tracing approaches. And I'll walk you through both. So the first uh, um, analysis was a histological analysis where Gianni um, saw, as has been also published, that this tumor is heterogeneous. So it has uh, cells that are much smaller, which I'll show you to be proliferating, and cells that are much larger, which are differentiated. And when it Gianni stands for differentiated markers, it is being localized in these cells. When it looks at a proliferation marker, such as the K67, it sees that this is a front of proliferative cells. And when in collaboration with Laurel is looking at stem cell marker, it sees a stem cell marker also be localized there. So this is uh, indicative of the fact that these tumors have cells in it that do retain or do acquire stem cell character. But in order to address whether these tumors are coming from stem cells, we need to turn to a very rigorous approach, which is based on a Cree-based system. So the Cree will basically be able to mark specifically cells depending on the promoter we give, and then mark cells by using a reporter, say a GFP reporter. And so Chico is a lab manager in the lab, but has been uh, fantastic in setting up all the lineage tracing tools we have. And so what Gianni did is to use mice that have a, uh, follicles that are marked with GFP, and this is just a broad promoter. So it's a K14, is marking every epithelial cell. As a, as a positive control, what he sees is that in fact the areas of these tumors are GFP positive, therefore are coming from the epithelial cells initially labeled. And what Johnny will have any day now as an answer is uh, if he uses a promoter that is now more restricted, so here is a follicle, here is the epidermis, you see it's mostly blue, which is marked by DAPI, 
by cis GFP now in a restricted area, which coincide in the stem cell niche, then what Gianni will be able to tell is whether the tumor is derived by these cells or not. And finally, um, when Gianni wants to know whether the signals, uh, the control keratocantoma, are actually signal utilized during hair regeneration, um, what we decided to do to address this question is to collaborate uh, and work with Christine about transcription of profile from human. So from our previous data in mice, we know that wind pathway, among others, are pathways that are utilized to control regeneration. So the hypothesis is that this pathway, say for instance the wind pathway, we need to be shut down in the regression phase, therefore perhaps in the regression phase of the keratoganthoma. So Christine is collecting a number of data from human uh, samples, uh, and uh, from preliminary data, I'll show you how the wind might be a good candidate. Just to remind you, wind is a, the wind uh, of, uh, factors in the pathway, uh, wind is a ligand that will be bound into a receptor, and uh, the this pathway can be inhibited by um, receptor inhibitors li such as like frizzle related protein or SFRP. And uh, um, if the uh, pathway is active, uh, what is going to happen is beta-tectinin can uh, translocate to the nucleus and activate downstream target genes such as SP5 and axin 2 So again, uh, Kristen has some data uh, from uh, a few patients, but from her preliminary data, what we could do is to map basically keratocantoma data from the growth phase in red uh, from the regression phase in uh, dark green and from the total remission of keratocantoma in light green. And what Gianni has been doing is use uh, uh, our prior understanding in mice and look at this pathway, in particular the wind in the Christine data. And so the two of the receptor of the wind pathway are actually upregulated as the tumor is regressing. And you also looked at the factors downstream, so uh, SP5 and axin 2 um, and there, there are some encouraging data that suggest that actually SP5 is downregulated as the tumor will go into regression. This is preliminary and more data will be added to it, but I think it's sufficient to give us uh, some insight on what to pursue. So what Johnny is doing is testing the downstream effectors into the mouse model that he was able to recapitulate, the growth and the regression of the keratoacanthoma, and test whether the downstream factors of the wind or other pathway are actually regulated as we predict in the mouse models, and they also test it functionally by injecting with inhibitors whether we can uh, induce the precocious regression of these tumors. And so the idea behind this project is one, we can understand about way that the tumor, um, the keratocantoma in general tumors can regulate uh, their growth and regression and with the hope that if we are able to identify a specific signal that can induce the regression, then might be applicable to tumors that do not regress. And so to conclude, uh, uh, the last part of, in, of the summary will tell you that we are investigating the lineage of origin of the keratocantoma and test the what drivers uh, uh, of the signaling that we see expressed in the keratocantoma during regression may actually lead to this um, self-regression. And in future direction, we like to combine the in vivo imaging setup we have done to understand tumor dynamics. And also, we are uh, already pursuing genetic analysis by specific pathway, both uh, loss of function, say, for BMP and gain of function for winds to understand uh, in a cleaner way how the uh, tumor insurgents and the upper proliferative phenotypes are, are arising. So to conclude, what I've told you is something that is not specific to the hair follicle, but instead the hair follicle is a paradigm for different tissues because all the features that I've told you about the stem cell niche are actually conserving many other tissues. And with that, I would like to introduce you to the very talented group of people that have been performing all this experiment. Jenny has been able to set up this from scratch with the tumor model in collaboration with Christine Ko. Um, Elizabeth is a student in the lab interested in signaling. And the Ichiko is the lab manager that has set up all the Cree lineage system. Padelis is a postdoc that has set up the two photon in vivo imaging. Carol uh, is doing a very exciting project, it's rotating right now in the lab, but I didn't have time to cover. And Laurel is another rotation student that I mentioned for the stem cell markers. Collaborators are very invaluable. Christine Ko is a, a, a main and fantastic collaborator on this project. Oscar Collegio was fantastic at the beginning of the project to set it up. Dave and Ann Aberman for the two photon imaging and other projects in collaboration with other people. Thank you.